this next song encourages us to celebrate Christmas or the, the birth of Christ every day. Listen to the beautiful music of Brenda Sullinger. was born so far away so the story is told we remember Christmas Day when winter days grow cold with a time it passes by we put away the trim Then we live and wonder why We can't remember him The Christmas star shines once a year And then it fades away It's Christmas every day It's not the bells and it's not the snow And it's not the gifts we get But he was born so long ago It's easy to forget But men can't go alone We get lost along the way But he can bring us home Remember him throughout the year Without the star above He left us all one Christmas gift He left the gift of love The Christmas star shines once a year And then it fades away And it's Christmas every day. Every day. Well, that's better than last week. <laughs> Brenda, thank you. We needed one more Christmas song, and what a great reminder that uh, we can have Christmas every day. I, I do have a friend who keeps her tree up all year long. And, uh, and not because she's one of my friends, but just because when I met her, she was this way. I think, and you're a little kooky. <laughs> and uh, when she was telling me she left her tree up every day, I thought... Why? And she says, because it's Christmas every day at my house. And I said, well, Barbara, no offense, but you live alone. <laughs> you know, and so uh, she sat me down and she said, I have this deal. And she said, every time um, one of our military men come home uh, and it's not Christmas, they are invited over to my house to celebrate Christmas with their children. So three or four times a week, a whole family uh, of somebody who's been deployed that's now come home and it's 
March instead of December, they get to go over to her house and have Christmas. Isn't that nice? And she said, that's a way for me to be reminded of Christmas every day. And, and so she's still kooky. Uh, but, but I love that. And uh, that's, I was reminded of that while you were singing that song. And, and what, a, what, a great, what a great message. It needs to be Christmas every day. Um, I'm going to talk to you about starting strong. And I've put together a master's plan for your New Year's resolution. And uh, you might be thinking, well, if you put it together, how is it the master's plan? And uh, that's your problem to figure out. Uh, this is just what I was thinking about, and I was praying about it, and this is what I came up with. But I promise you, uh, most of us don't do well with resolutions. How many of you even remember one of your resolutions last year? You remember it? Did you achieve it? Okay, no. How, did you achieve your re resolution? Of course you did. Teacher's pet. Uh, but most of us will make resolutions, and, and, and what is a resolution? It means you, you're, res, you're, you're resulting to do this. I'm, I'm resolute. I'm going to follow through and get this done. I love when people tell me, you know, I'm resolute. I'm going to get that done. Here's what I know. No, you're not. And unless you have thought it through, and unless you have a plan, and your plan has a time pressure on it, I'm guessing you're not going to get it done. I've learned this over the years, over the years of, uh, of being led and being in leadership. I have figured out, unless there is a plan with time pressure, it's probably not going to happen. I mean, as, as good as you feel about it and as, and as desperate as you want it to be done, it may not happen. Uh, FDR said it this way, people do what you inspect, not what you expect. And that's true with us. And a matter of fact, we, we have uh, negative thoughts a lot of times about our, the resolutions we make. We try really hard to make these great resolutions and stick to them. And then we begin to think only of the negative part. I hate this thing. It's everywhere but in front of my mouth. You know what I mean? It's just kind of one of those deals. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll speak through my nose. <laughs> okay. Uh, for instance, I, I can give you names of biblical characters, and you're not going to remember the positive. You're going to remember the negative. You're going to remember the negative because we've been through some of this lately, and, uh, and I mostly just taught on the negative. For instance, if I say the word Jonah, what are you going to remember? You're going to remember the whale. You're going to remember he was somebody who was not going to do what God told him to do. You're going to remember that he went the other direction. You're going to remember all these things about him, and you're going to say, yeah, but old Jonah, he didn't do what God told him to do. You're not going to remember that he was an evangelist who went into a city and saw a half a million people be saved. Nobody's going to remember that. Nobody's going to remember he's the greatest evangelist that ever lived. If I use the word Samson, what are you going to say? Samson, he's a permissive sexual addict. Uh, he, he didn't have his life under control. He was sadistic. You're going to forget that in the book of Judges, it says for 20 years, 20 years, he judged rightly over the nation of Israel. Not going to remember that part. Because we, in our personality, there's something about us that wants to be negative. If I said King David to you, what are you going to remember? You remember Bathsheba. You remember all the trouble he had in his home. You remember all these mistakes. He got proud, and, and because he got proud, thousands of men died. You're not going to remember that he's the great king of Israel who took the two divided nations and brought them together. You're not going to remember that he's the writer of Psalms. You're not going to remember that God says he's a man after God's own heart. You're going to remember the negative. You're going to do the same thing in your own life, aren't you? You're going to remember that, uh, that you made some resolutions and they probably had something to do with your health and your weight. And probably had something to do with, with your finances. And So here I stand, just as heavy as I was last year. I'm, my health is bad. I can barely move because of my back. And I don't even want to talk about my finances. And so, so you, you know, you're just going to think down the negative trail. You're not going to think of the positive things that have happened, the wonderful things that have happened. Can I just tell you, I mean, this Christmas was great for me personally. 
I guess it was great for me personally because it, it didn't have anything to do with me personally, and I figured that out. I mean, we had a fun time. We had a great time uh, in our Eve Eve service. I hope you were here. I, if you weren't here, nana nana. I mean, it, it just it was it was over the top. Great. It was worshipful, and it was fun. And and for a week, I've been. I, I just I walk around. And I say, I sure do love those Christmas cookies, sugar, and I, I can't get it out of my mind. You know, uh, and. And, and I, I can't get out of my mind just how wonderful it was to look up and see packed house. I mean, people were standing. There was, I don't know what we hold, but we were beyond it. And it was just wonderful. And people enjoyed it. And it just did my heart good to see that, that we could do something that the people would enjoy. And so I, I, I want to really talk to you about this idea of resolutions. But I want to break it down in three areas. Because these are the three areas that are important in your life. Believing, when I say believing, I mean believing correctly. Believing the right thing, the right way, so that you can function in a wonderful way. And belonging, belonging such an important thing. You, no, no man is an island. We don't stand alone. And we are much stronger when we belong to a to a, to a unit, to a, to a group, to a people who are like-minded, to a people who love us and we get to love them back. And then becoming. The idea of process. The idea that that's what the Christian life is. The Christian life is believing something and having it so solid in your mind and heart that nobody can take it away from you. Not even you. You can't doubt your way out of faith. You understand it well enough that you know that by grace you are saved. And then the second thing is the belonging, just to belong in, in, in a group of people that are functioning toward the kingdom of God and that you're in it together and that nobody is operating isolated or hurting alone or experiencing a victory because of something they did. It's, it's a group effort. It's a part of belonging to something. You know, one of the problems in America today is how fragmented we all are, how we don't belong to anything else. I mean, you know, people used to belong to clubs. People used to belong to, to associations. They used to have places that they would go that, that they could be with people that, that thought like they did and believed the way they did. But they, we don't have that anymore. And the church has lost its momentum in terms of belonging. We got a lot of people attending. But we don't have a lot of people belonging. A lot of people, you know, it, it, it's kind of like kind of like you go to the kind of like you go to the, the 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 game today. And you get out there and and uh, you know, I'm, I'm if I if I went out today, I'd wear my Sean Lee jersey. And I'd have that on just in case Red Jay wanted to call me in out of the fans and put me in. Because he needed me. Because I, like I, I look like them. I'm not them. No, they, they have struggled. They have worked. They have gotten themselves in shape. They have done all that. And they're in the battle because they're prepared to be in the battle. I just look like I want to be in the battle. Because I paid however much too much for a jersey of a guy who can't stay on the field because he breaks like a piece of glass. But that's another story. But the idea is you've got to be on the team. You've got to belong. One of the hardest things to do is to even be wounded and belong to something. I'm watching those kids yesterday, you know, on the Oklahoma bench and, and over there on the Alabama bench. And you know what the saddest thing is when they pan the bench? is the four or five guys that are on crutches. And they're not dressed out. And you can see on their faces the pain of not being able to be in the game. We need to belong. And then the idea of becoming. No, none of us have arrived. We are in a process of, of becoming. And, and uh, you know, the old, the old poet said, every day and every way I'm getting better and better. And er no, forget that. We are becoming as we become closer and closer to God, as we lose less, uh, we see less and less of ourselves and more and more of God in us. That's when we really are becoming. And that ought to be the direction of where it is we go in terms of what am I going to resolve? What, what's my action plan going to be? 
And when am I going to achieve it so that I'm believing correctly, so that I'm belonging the way that I need to belong, and so that I'm becoming what it is that God wants me to become? So that's the framework. Now, let me begin by believing right about what? First of all, believing right about Christ. Who is God? Who is the wonder of God? Uh, yeah, I know it's politically correct to say, well, you know, there's all kinds of gods. You know, Buddha was a god. Muhammad was a god. You know, no. No, there is one true and, 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 and only God, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. God with skin on. And then believing right about the Bible. What does the Bible say? What does it say about me? You know, um, by, by day, I run a counseling center. You know the first thing I say to somebody who comes in for counseling? I ask one question in the beginning before we say anything else. I ask them this question. Have you sought advice through Scripture? And they look at you and they go, what? Well, you've stated your problem and I get it. Have you sought advice through Scripture? What is God's Word telling you about your issue, about your problem? Well, I, I, uh, I, haven't, I haven't looked that closely. And any counselor worth spit would ask you that question. Have you sought God's counsel first? Well, so many of us don't. So not sure what we believe about the Bible. And then I, I want us to, to, to believe right about self. Believe right about who we are. To do that self-examination so that we understand who we are in self. So those are the three areas. Now, when I take the first area, I, I, it guides me to John 14, 6, where the Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the way. I am it. And so I want to just go over three critical questions that I want us to deal with to make sure we're believing right about Christ. And these are three questions that will help you understand if you are in the right place and you're believing the right thing about Jesus. I don't want to assume anything. And so these are the three critical questions. The first one is, do you know the origin of the species of which you are a part? You may look at me and say, that's a science question. Okay. It is a science question. And it's only scientifically right in one way. When it is about the truth. And Jesus said, I am the truth. Not I tell you the truth. I am the truth. You know, it's important. If you don't, if you don't accept the Genesis explanation for the origins, the odds are that you don't have any idea where human came from. If you accept anything else, and call it whatever you want to call it, you want to call it scientific data, it doesn't matter what you call it, it is incorrect because the Bible has deemed it so, and God's Genesis account now is being proved by scientific means to be the only reasonable account for human beings. You're a human being. You didn't slither out of the water, and you didn't develop, you're a human being. You were made in God's image. And we have not changed all that much over the years. We've gotten softer because we live in a softer world. But it's very important to be able to answer that question and understand it. Second question is, what is your purpose of human existence? Why? Why are you here? What is your purpose? When's the last time you asked yourself that? What's my purpose? Well, if you don't accept the biblical explanation for mankind's purpose that we are created by God to glorify God, then you will have no idea why you're here. If you're not actively in the pursuit of glorifying God, then you're not doing the purpose God created you for. God created us to praise Him. God created us to be a part of His kingdom. Which leads me to the third question. Where are you going? 
Where are you going? Which would force a person to ask, you know, what, you know, what happens to me after death? Where am I going? The truth is, if, if you don't know what eternity holds for you, the best you have is a guess. A sorry stab in the dark. So, if you don't know where you came from, if you don't know what you're doing here, and you don't know where you're going, you're officially lost. Meaning that you've never been able to believe right. And you know what might have gotten in your way? The thought that you can behave yourself in such a way that you can attain righteousness. Because you can't. Blaise Pascal, are you impressed? I'm throwing out a big theological name. Philosopher, French guy. Uh, when I took my one philosophy class in seminary, I really liked this guy. But listen to what he said. There are only two kinds of people. The righteous who believe themselves sinners. The rest sinners who believe themselves righteous. Isn't that great? And what may be keeping you lost is the idea that you're righteous. The idea that somehow within you there is some wonderful part of you that God doesn't need to care for. Listen, the greatest Christian that ever lived, the Apostle Paul, who had maybe the greatest mind that's ever walked on the face of the earth, save for, save for, for Jesus himself, this guy, who had all the pedigree in the world, said, I'm rubbish. I'm rubbish. You know what, you know what led Martin Luther to his thesis? What led him to to groan and moan and begin to write and begin to think about God in a different way was the fact that he couldn't get out of his mind that he was constantly sinning. And there was a righteousness that took him over and guided him to get into Scripture and look at Scripture and to begin to agree with Scripture. We need to make sure that we're believing the right thing. Listen to what the Bible says. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, he says, uh, Don't misunderstand why I have come. He's talking about the Bible. He said, I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No. No, I came to accomp accomplish their purpose. And I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. It's important you understand that you belong to Jesus, and then it's important that you understand that Jesus was all about the Word. That in his earthly ministry, he used the Word himself. In his own humanness, when challenged by Satan, it was the word of God that he would say, God's word says, God's word says. And what he's saying to them now is, I didn't come to abolish the word of God. Matter of fact, I came to accomplish it, which means the Old Testament was written to show you you can't accomplish it. And here is Mr. Man, perfect in his human and yet divine in his nature, who came to accomplish the word of God, not to do away with it. He would go on in verses 19 and 20, and he says, so if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's law and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of, religion, of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of God. You can't get there through your behavior. But Jesus is saying you can trust the word. I'm going to give you some stats uh, about the word. There are five basic truths about the Bible that you need to understand. The first one is, is that it's a book of authority. It's a book of authority. Second is, it's the, it's, the Bible is a, a prophetic book. There are things that were said in it that actually came true. 
So there is a sense of prophecy within the Bible. The Bible is permanent. There's no moving away from it. The Bible reveals a person. And the Bible requires commitment. Uh, I love it when people want to talk about the mistakes that are in the Bible, and they want to talk about the proof text. And, and even as we're standing here today, they have found a new method, and they are now going through ashes in the caves where they have found the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they are pulling ashes together, and because of some new way, they can heat up the ashes, and they're actually seeing words. They're seeing pages again. And these are some findings that we haven't had. In 1949, a Bedouin shepherd boy kicked a rock. It went into a hole. He went down and he found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he pulled them up. And it's most of the Old Testament intact, some pieces of the New Testament. And, and here, here they, they tested it out. And, of course, uh, the people who don't believe in God said, okay, now we have this. We're going to be able to lay this down and show them that their Bible is false. And all it did is prove over and over and over again the Bible is is a reliable book because of what they found and now we're finding more and there are critics who are going to say yeah now we're going to get the real truth no we're going to get more proof that the bible is exactly what it says it is as a matter of fact there are 5,750 documents right now and and they were found 30 years after the book of john which means they were found very close by to the actual events that they were written about now Plato, a lot of people enjoy him, there are seven total copies of Plato, not 5,750, seven, seven, and they were found 1,200 years after the originals. What's chances of those being correct? Aristotle, Aristotle, there are five copies of his writings, and they were found 1,400 years after their writing. See, the Bible is reliable. It is 66 books written over 1,600 years with 40 different authors, with 40 different jobs, and from 40 different cultures. And God took all that by the power of the Holy Spirit. And at the end of the book, you have one enemy, Satan, one hero, Jesus. And it all fits together in the power of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to be your Bible. It is still the bestseller. It will always be the bestseller. The Bible is a book that is, it, it, it is more trustworthy than any other thing that you can read. And it's a shame that we all have Bibles, and yet so little of time is spent seeking God's wisdom. The next thing, belonging. Belonging where? Well, you need to belong, first of all, the universal body of Christ, and that's your personal salvation. When, when you become saved, you, you, have a, a, you belong to the universal church. That's not something that is seen. The second thing is the church, the local body of believers, which involves four things. If you're going to be the part, of a, part of a local body of believers, you're going to have, number one, membership. Can't be on the team unless you join the team. Now, there's a lot of people who, who say, oh, well, I, I really don't need a church, and yet it's one of the basic doctrines of the faith. God wanted us to come together and be a part of the church. And so he has structured it in such a way that if you're belonging to a church or you're coming to a church, and I get it, you visit, you make sure that these are the people you like, you make sure that these are the people that you can love. You make sure they're going to love you back. You make sure the pastor's not an idiot. You make sure of a lot of things. But then membership is critical. It just is. Uh, I've, never, I've never been the, uh, a part of a team where we brought somebody else on the team, and, and he, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't a part of the team. Even in business, a lot of times you'll bring in a consultant. And a consultant can say anything he wants to say, and everybody acts like it's golden. Well, he doesn't have to live here. He doesn't have to live with the, with the results of the decision that he's making. It's those that are there. It's those that are, that are given to that, to that group. It's those that are in there. Can you not find it? You got it? Oh, there it is. Nope, that's not it. Um, 
So membership is a key. The second thing is baptism. Baptism. You know, there's, there's something about baptism that just, that just lets you know you belong. I mean, baptism, legitimately, what baptism is, is it's once you have found Jesus as your personal Savior. It is your first act of obedience. It's the first thing that you can do. It's the first step that you can take that says, I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's your first witness to the world. Can I tell you, I just have trouble understanding why somebody who is be, he's trying to be a member of a church and they want to be a member of the church and they say, I want to be a member, but I, I don't think I want to be baptized. I'm like, excuse me? Can I tell you what? You go to another denomination, pick one, and you join their church and you tell them, eh, no thanks, I don't think I want to be baptized. You know what they're going to say to you? Then you're not a member. Members are baptized into the body of Christ. It's a part of coming to Christ. It's a part of all that process. I came to know Christ at 17. I wasn't baptized till I was 20-something. And I remember people would share the gospel with me, and, and, and I'd be going to church, and I'd say, well, okay, okay, yeah, I get it. As a matter of fact, I used to pray with people just so they'd feel good. I could tell them, I think I won that guy. Well, okay. You want to accept Jesus? All right, if that'll get you home. Uh, I'll do it. But, you know, finally, one guy, one pastor was talking to me, and he was going around. I said, why do people always decide to share that with me? And he said, because you hadn't been obedient in the first things. And I said, like what? I had no idea. So as a pastor, I don't want to be guilty of you having no idea. He looked at me, and he said, if you're saved, you get baptized. You know what my response was? Okay, when can I do that? How quickly can we get that done? I'm in, I'm ready. And that's the way it ought to be. But for some reason today, people want to hang on to something. You know, if somebody comes and joins the Baptist church and, and, and they're challenged on their baptism because, well, I was, you know, I was sprinkled or dotted on or squirted at. And, and, and you say, well, we believe in, in or as done when I was a little baby, and, but we believe that you come to Christ and then your baptism, your, your biblical baptism follows that. Remember, it's two sacraments, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper and the sacrament of baptism. Some of you might have been baptized sometime before you got saved. Baptized as a 12-year-old child, and then later at 22, away at college, you accepted Christ for the first time in your life, and you just thought, yeah, I'll just blow off that baptism thing. It is vital. It is important. It is a sacrament out of Scripture. And you can never really feel settled in your heart until you've settled that with God. And it's not about us, and it's not about how many people we can get wet it's about what it does to your heart, how it ignites you, what it, what it does for you. Just like, just like we, we do the Lord's Supper. We do the Lord's Supper so it will register to you what a great God we have. So it's membership, it's baptism, and it's serving. Serving. When you're, when you're in a church, the, the options are serve. No second option. Because here's what happens. When you came to know Christ, no matter who you are, he gave you a gift, a biblical gift. And it's in, it's in your personality, it's in your soul, and you need to exercise that or you're never going to be happy, you're never going to be fulfilled in the church. I guarantee you, every disgruntled person I've ever known in the church was not exercising their spiritual gift. That's the way you can tell the disgruntled. Just look for the ones who aren't giving their gift back to the church. And I'm telling you, you can't make them happy. Don't even try. God put an energy in you. God believes in the church. When, when he turned to Peter and he said, you know, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And he said, upon that, uh, upon that rock-like truth, I'm going to build my church. 
I'm going to build a church, and I'm going to bring people to me, and those people are going to meet me. They're going to be baptized. They're going to join a Bible-believing church. They're going to stay in the Word of God, and they're going to be gifted from the Holy Spirit. Do you realize the Holy Spirit gave you a gift, not a talent, a gift that He wants done in the, in the service of the church? And if you're not doing it, we're limping. If you're not doing it, it's not getting done. Period. Period. You're, you're like a quarterback with no weak side tackle. You know what that means? Never mind. Doesn't matter. It, it means that you're going to be on the ground a lot, face down, especially if you're right-handed. It means you're not going to see anybody coming. You don't have the, enough peripheral vision to see the blow you're going to take. And uh, the churches across America, that is the problem. We have people who have not followed correctly in membership. They've not done the business of what God instructs us to do. And they're not exercising their gifts. And because they're not exercising their gifts, there's no movement. We become static. We become unimportant. You show me a church that is exercising their gifts, and I'll show you a church that's tearing it up. There's a church down in Austin called Victory. Anybody ever heard of it? They've decided they're going to feed the poor. Now, there's some things about them that I think are a little theologically, whoop. But let me tell you what, they are exercising their gift. And I would say nearly 100% of the people that join that church have the gift of service. And you know what they're doing? They're feeding the poor. The poor anywhere around them get breakfast, lunch, and dinner because they're focused and because God is choosing to bless. And then once they feed them physically, they feed them spiritually. And you watch this little church, it's growing and growing and growing. It's becoming a real movement. It's maybe the only good thing out of California in years. But that's the idea. And then giving. Then giving. You know, if you get the others straight, the giving doesn't hurt at all becomes just joyful. That's why Paul called it a joy. Once you completely understand grace and you completely understand that you're in God's church and you begin to figure out, wow, this is, this is my experience with him. What a joy. If he asks you to give something back, give it. Who cares? It's not yours anyway. Once you understand it all belongs to God, then it's much easier to give it back. God has so blessed us he has given us so much. And then we just kind of try to hang on that one little part that, that we're supposed to give back. I, I don't get it. And, and I'm, I'm not the guy, okay? I'm not the preacher who's checking. I don't check. I don't know what any of y'all give. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. It's not my responsibility. What my responsibility is hold up the joy that comes when you give. And to feel sorry if you're not experiencing that joy. And once again, you're not sneaking up on anybody. If you're a miserable Christian, I know for certain you're not a giving Christian. Because there's no such thing as a miserable saint of God. Well, I was reading a little bit about church sizes. thought this was interesting. This guy divided them up as a cat, a collie, a garden, a house, a mansion, a ranch, and a nation. Guess where we landed? I'm happy to be out of that cat category. I'm just, just not a cat lover. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I can't even think about leading a cat. You, you don't lead a cat. Cat just is, right? Cat just is there. But then you, get, you can be a collie. Well, collies are nice dog, but they bark a lot. Uh, but we're actually, our size makes us a garden church. And that's, that's perfect. That's perfect. A garden church. Because that means if you have a garden church, you know every plant that's in your garden. That's what's enjoy about, enjoyable about a church, about a church that's this size. You know the name of every plant in your garden. You can walk out if you're, a, if you're a gardener and you can start naming the plants. 
And then you want to take care of those plants. And you know what kind of care they need. You know how much sun they need. You plant them in the right spot. You know how much water they need. So you water them. You know how much they need of this and that and the other. Nutrients, you put that, you give that to them. Because that's what you want to do. You want to nurture that garden because you want that garden to grow big and rich and healthy. So we're a garden church. But I tell you what. We're not far away from being a house. And you can't fear that. Matter of fact, you've got to just embrace that. But you've got to be whatever it is that God is blessing you to be. The blessing of ministry is growth. Period. The blessing of anything is a result. I worry about people who say, well, you have a, you know, they got a good heart. Well, they did that. Yeah, but they had a good heart. No, you've got to get something done at some point. Jesus was looking for results. And so the idea of, of setting ourselves up to have the best result is a great idea. I'm so excited about this year because we're going to have we're going to have different people come in. We're going to have people talk to us about our building being a, a hundred years old, and to, you know it doesn't matter. I don't care that the building's a hundred years old. I think that's cool and that's neat, but it's just a way to talk to people about Jesus. So that's why we're going to have a big hundred year celebration. That's why we're going to put on the dog, not so that they can come look at our building and go, "Wow, hundred years old. Love the stained glass." Later, no. So that, so that people would be interested in hearing about how does something last 100 years? What kind of people are inside that make something move? What kind of people started the place that, that got it to this point, and now what kind of people are there now that are going to take it on for the next 100 years? And so we begin to push that. Mark down March 17th because Jimmy Draper is going to come. And you're so sick of hearing his name. And all of you sitting there, okay, I'll come hear the guy just to get him heard. And you will not be disappointed. Hey, he's God's, one of God's greatest gift to Christendom in his generation. And he's going to come to our church. And you're going to get to hear him. And I'm going to be so pleased for you. The next thing is self. We need self-worth. Self-worth is the belief that your life has value and significance. And to have self-esteem, it is, it is to respect or have high regard for yourself. And God has established your real worth by knowing that he has chosen you. Matter of fact, in, in the book of Ephesians, it says, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Your worth is established by what somebody is willing to pay. Would you agree with that? That's how you establish worth. It doesn't matter if it's a sailboat or a car or a television. It is established only by what somebody is willing to give for it. And, and how much they are willing to give establishes the worth for whatever that is. I learned that the hard way. I got to Texas and being born and raised in Southern California, I was driving along one day and I saw a 63 VW. And the guy wanted $500 for it. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? In L.A., that's worth $1,500. So I stopped and bought it. I'm going to make $1,000. I'm going to turn this thing around. All I'm going to do is clean it up. I knew a little bit about VWs. and So I began to clean it up and put it out there for $1,500, and nobody's touching it. I held on to that thing for six months. You know what I sold it for? $500. What did I learn? I learned that's what it was worth. That's all it was worth. You were purchased, purchased by God before the foundation of the world, in eternity past, when God thought you through, when he knew you before you were anything, before he created the world, when he knew who you were, he, he, he caused himself to love you and to call you holy and call you his, and God said, you're worth the death of my precious son. There's your worth. There it is. And I know some people struggle. They struggle with their self-worth. They struggle with their self-esteem. Sometimes you just want to go over and just shake them and say, get over your bad self. 
doesn't matter what you think of you. Get a God image, and you'll understand that you have a good self-image. You have to love yourself. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Second commandment's like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, some of you hate your neighbor because you're angry at you. There's some things you say to you that if somebody else said it to you, you'd punch them in the nose. And yet you allow you to say that. If you're going to belong and you're going to believe and you're going to do all that, you've got to understand that's what God wants. And then the purpose of belonging is, uh, is the fact that the church wants you to be, a, be here for worshiping, for instruction, for fellowship, for evangelism. And a good way to remember that is the acrostic wife. Church is like a wife. Like a wife. Worship, that's what the church is for. Instruction, yes. Fellowship, yes. Evangelism, yes. We have to check those off to make sure we're really a church. That's what God wants. And you know what? Some people have stayed away from the church because they've been angered or frustrated or something bad has happened to them. And I, I was thinking about that, and I, I read back through John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress in one spot. Christian and Hopeful, the two characters that are in that, fell asleep on a, in a field that belonged to the giant of despair. When the giant came along, he grabbed them and he took them to Doubting Castle and he put them down in a stinking dungeon. And he went to his wife and said, I have, I have captured Christian and Hopeful. And she said, give them no water, don't feed them, and beat them within an inch of their life. And then tell them they need to decide to commit suicide. And so the giant goes down and does exactly what his wife told him to, be, to do. He, did, he didn't feed them. He didn't give them any water. And then he beat them to an inch of their lives. And as he left, he said, now, you think about suicide. And when he left, they began to discuss their plight. And Christian said, I was given a key that I still have on me. It is the key of promise. He said, I bet it will unlock the door of this dungeon. And he pulled the key of promise out, and it did. It unlocked that door. It unlocked every door in the Doubting Castle. And it unlocked the front gate of the Doubting Castle. And they got back up on the king's highway. Some of you fell asleep in the giant's garden. And you've been in Doubting Castle. And God's calling us back to belonging. And finally, becoming. Now, you know, if you've been here and you've heard me preach at all, you know, we get to the last, I got your three points for you, right? Remember these three things? Here's, here's three things to do. Here's three things to think about. Here's not giving them to you. You're going to make them up. Because your becoming is my master plan for you. What action will I take? I've just given you some things to think about in the area of believing. And if you've got a problem in believing, you need to ask yourself, what action am I going to take to correct my believing? I've doubted the Bible. I've doubted Christ as my Savior. I've not been this. I haven't done that. Then you have to put down what the action is that you're going to take that's going to make that difference. So maybe it's around believing. Maybe it's around belonging. Maybe there are issues in belonging and there's some things holding you back. And, and, and rather than a, revolution, a resolution, I want you to make a commitment, an action plan. And right there I've written down seven. I picked seven because I ran out of the page. You might have 12. You might have two. You might have one. But the idea is to write down the action that you think God wants you to take in the area of believing, belonging, and becoming. Think about those things. Ponder them this week and decide. Now, there's some things that I think God wants from me that he doesn't currently have. So I'm going to write that down. And I'm going to say, okay, I wrote it down. All right, then put a date. You're going to take action on it. I'm telling you what works is you decide on an action and then you challenge it with a date. 
There are a lot of things I want to do, and I'll look at my calendar and think, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do this other thing. If I haven't put a date to it, if I haven't put time pressure on it, it's not going to happen. I'm going to work out. Really when? Tomorrow. What time? See the difference? See the difference? You've got to just have pressure. Pressure. I learned a long time ago because I used to give orders to my, to my assistants and, and to my associates. And I'd say, hey, could you guys do this and that and the other for me? You bet. Okay. Week goes by. Hey, did you do that? Do what? This and that and the other? No. Well, could you do that for me? Yeah. Nothing. But when you go in there and say, here's what I need. I need one, two, three. I need it by tomorrow afternoon. Okay. Guess what happens tomorrow afternoon? It's done. People only do what they have time pressure on. So that's your job this week on becoming. Get in your space. Begin to think about what God wants in the area of believing, belonging, and becoming. And write it down. Put your action plan down. And then put a time frame on it. And watch God make a difference. Not just in your life, but in the life of everybody around you. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have a plan for our life. A wonderful plan. A plan not to destroy us, but a plan for good. A plan to use us in a very unique and special way. I just pray, God, we would give you the glory to understand that. And that we, we would begin now discovering on our own what it is you have for us specifically that we would write it down that we would put a date on when we're going to accomplish what it is that you've called us to do help us to become the best we've ever been in 2019 in jesus name amen